So most of my career, I've been a developer and an architect. Um, but in the early 2000s, through a somewhat bizarre and uh, slightly desperate set of circumstances, uh, I made a, a trip into operations, and I lived in operations for a while. Um, and in fact, I, I lived in a part of operations where I wasn't just responsible for the availability of systems, I was responsible for the availability of systems that I didn't write. I had to keep other people's code running and get the wake-up call when their code failed in the middle of the night. Um, my initial reaction was, oh, I've got this. I've been running stuff in production for a long time. No problem. And then uh, after a few weeks, reality set in. And I started to realize that almost all of the production failures we were dealing with had nothing to do with hardware and nothing to do with the network. They were divided roughly into two categories. One was operator error, and usually sort of an induced error because things were misleading or, or ambiguous. And the other was software defects. Um, operator error, that's a separate topic for a, a different kind of conference, a lot of interesting stuff around there. But the software defects are something that we ought to be able to do something about. So I was uh, one of the few people in operations who had a background in development and could look at the software defects, dig down to the individual lines of source code, and send my uh, uh, bug reports with patches and fixes back to the development teams. And I found that um, these problems came in categories or types. I started to see recurring situations, commonly recreated problems. This was actually a hopeful discovery, because if problems come in types, then maybe we can find categorical solutions for those types of problems. So I took my, uh, my experiences of you know, living in another field and, and sort of being in a foreign country for a while, uh, and I tried to bring them back into the development world uh, with this book, Release It, which is all about you know, what do we do to make our software run in production? How, does it, how do you get it to survive more than just QA? How do you survive contact with the real world? And as I got into this, I, I got in touch with some of the uh, long and rich discipline of reliability engineering in other areas, mechanical and electrical and civil engineering and so on. Uh, so I want to start by providing just a, a little bit of terminology, a, a couple of definitions. Um, the first is availability. So what does it mean for something to be available? Uh, it's the probability that the system is operating at time t. So when I try to do something, is the system going to successfully complete that thing? Now, notice this doesn't talk about servers being up and running. It doesn't talk about hardware being alive or networks functioning. It actually talks about being able to complete the mission that I'm giving it. So if I'm trying to do a business process, I can complete the business process. If I'm doing a transaction, I can do a transaction and so on. Now, availability is not something you can directly control. It's the result, it's an output variable, it's a, a dependent variable based on your ability to create stability in your system. And stability is the architectural characteristic that allows you to maintain availability in the face of outrageous fortune, uh, the slings and arrows of faults and errors. Now, just a little more terminology. When I say fault, what I'm talking about is an incorrect internal state in your application. So a fault arises in your application through one of two ways. One is that you've got a latent defect, and that defect creates an incorrect internal state. Uh, the other place that a fault can enter your system is through the perimeter, through interfaces into your system, uh, bad data that you're not correctly checking for. Uh, you might call that a defect of omission. Um, malformed uh, network packets are a great place to see faults being injected. Now, a fault is not necessarily that bad. Faults do happen. Um, there are two broad schools of thought on how you deal with faults. One is fault tolerance. It means more or less exactly what it says. You can tolerate faults and recover. You can repair the incorrect internal state and get back to a nominal operating state. The other approach is fault intolerance. Uh, fault intolerance basically says, as soon as I detect an incorrect internal state, exit. 
terminate. Um, the fault intolerance school says there's no state as clean as your initial startup, so the best thing to do is to exit and let somebody else start you back up. This is the school of thought uh, that we see in uh, airline or actor-based systems. Fault tolerance tends to be uh, the state you see, or the approach you see in languages with exceptions, like Java, C Sharp, uh, Scala, Ruby, et cetera. Now the reason that we do any of these approaches is because we want to prevent a fault from creating an error. The error is when the fault becomes observably incorrect. So a fault can be latent in your application for a long time, uh, but if nobody ever sees it, it doesn't really matter. It's a Heisen bug. The error is when you actually produce incorrect output or uh, you start taking behaviors that you would normally not take. Um, so maybe it's not an output, but if your system suddenly begins uh, hammering another remote system with excessive requests, that's an error, uh, even though it's not really an output being produced. Some errors lead to failures. So failure is a loss of availability. You can no longer accomplish the mission that your system is meant to accomplish. And failure is what we really most want to avoid. So within this framework, we're going to look at some of those recurring patterns that I observed that create uh, uh, failures on a frequent basis. Now I refer to these as anti-patterns. So if a pattern is a solution to a problem in a context, an anti-pattern is simply a solution to a problem in a context that produces a worse context as a result. Um, it's something that people rediscover or recreate a lot, intentionally or otherwise, um, but we don't like it. It produces outcomes that uh, we'd rather not have. So the first uh, and most important, I'm, I'm only doing a subset of the anti-patterns because the, the whole thing takes about three hours uh, and I definitely don't have that much time. So I'm gonna give you the most important ones. By far, the single most important one is integration points. An integration point is any place where your application makes an out-of-process call. So you're talking over a socket, a pipe, maybe you're forking a new process, uh, remote procedure calls. All of these things are out to destroy your system. You should look at every integration point as uh, an evil to be avoided if possible and contained if not possible. And I'm gonna show you an example of how even your friendly neighborhood database is out to get you. Now, most of you have probably encountered things like database deadlocks, right? You've got two threads, one's holding a lock, needs another lock, the other one holds that lock, needs that lock. Textbook problem, in fact, it's been addressed in the textbooks for, I don't know, 40 years. Um, that's actually one of the easy situations. The database server can detect that problem and just abort one of the transactions one thread gets an error, the other one gets to complete, no problem. But I had a situation where there was a database on the other side of a firewall from my application server. And during the wee hours of the night, the database connections were sort of idle for a long period of time. And as they were idle, the firewall timed out connections from its table of allowed, um, allowed traffic. So a firewall exists to break the internet um, it's a computer with finite resources. It's got a table of rules uh, for when it allows packets through. On a packet that's trying to open a connection, it consults rules about the source IP, the destination IP, the port number, all of that. Once a connection is established, it just allows packets through. But if it expires a connection from that uh, table, then a new packet from the application server just gets dropped on the floor. The firewall doesn't send back an ICMP reset, which would tell the, the server that the connection is no longer available. It just drops the packet on the floor. So TCP says, aha, your network is unreliable. I'm going to retransmit. And it retransmits, and that gets dropped on the floor. And this keeps going until the TCP IP abort interval elapses. The default is 10 minutes on that TCP IP abort interval. So it's gonna keep retransmitting for 10 minutes. 10 minutes on a web application in a data center is eternity. 10 minutes might as well be five days. So what would happen is um, the connection would appear broken after it had been idle for more than an hour. Now this problem appeared at five in the morning because during the night we had few enough uh, 
users that only one page was being served from each application server at a time. The connection pool that was being used to serve these pages was last in, first out. So one database connection would get exercised all through the night. The other 39 would sit there aging and getting dropped from the firewall. Five in the morning turned out to be the first time we needed to serve two pages simultaneously on one of these app servers. Well, the first one would get served from the connection that had been kept warm, and the second one would, well, it would block retransmitting and retransmitting and retransmitting until 10 minutes went by, at which point a SQL exception would be thrown. And the application server said, aha, this connection is no longer any good. I need to close the connection and discard it. Well, of course, closing the connection sends a packet to the database server, so that one gets dropped on the floor, and we go through the whole 10-minute retransmit timeout again. So basically, at 5 in the morning, all of our application servers hung every day until we diagnosed this problem. It took a few weeks. Now, the interesting thing about this is the number of parameters that had to be exactly right in order to observe this particular problem. So we're dealing with a database connection. Every application has a database. You talk to databases all the time. In order for this problem to manifest, we had to have a firewall in the way. Uh, the firewall had to have a short timeout on its uh, live connections table. We had to have a large enough application server pool that we didn't need to use multiple connections through the middle of the night. The connection pool had to be last in, first out, not first in, first out. Otherwise, they would have gotten refreshed enough. I can probably find other parameters. If the TCP IP abort interval had been set to a low number, then lots of people in the early morning would get errors, um, but the servers wouldn't hang. That might actually have been worse, because we wouldn't have detected that problem for even longer. But my point here is really to tell you that um, it's impossible to engineer away all of the failures that could possibly happen. Instead, you must expect failures to occur around every integration point you've got and deal with them. You need to put things in place to prevent a failure at an integration point like this from propagating to the entire system and taking your whole system down. Now, Got a lot of developers in the audience. We're all problem solvers by nature. If I don't tell you how to solve this problem, you're going to sit here thinking about it and Googling for it instead of listening to the rest of my talk. So I'm going to tell you how to solve this one. Um, it's to enable a feature that the database server has called dead connection detection. And basically, that's just a way of uh, checking if the client is still alive and cleaning up server-side resources if the client is dead. Periodically, the database server sends out a little ping packet up to the client and says, are you still alive? Are you still alive? You're not answering. You must be a Windows box. You're probably crashed. I'm going to clean up all my connection stuff. Well, in our case, we didn't actually care about things crashing and disappearing. We didn't need the dead connection detection to detect dead connections, but the ping packet was just enough to tell the firewall that the connection was still alive. So that's how we solved that one. And the good news is, You'll never have this problem because you've heard me describe this, and you'll be on the alert for it every time you see a firewall between your uh, application and your database. There's an alternative solution where you can uh, run a trivial query on a much more frequent basis than, uh, uh, than the timeout in the firewall. Uh, that one requires a little more effort in the code, so I prefer the uh, configuration solution. Could we have prevented this? Well, we could have prevented it from taking down the rest of the system. So uh, one of the things that was going on here is we would use a thread from a connection pool up front, or from a thread pool up front that was receiving the incoming requests. That thread would then be the same one that went and did the database query, and there was no mechanism for another timeout to be applied. Everything was synchronous and on the same thread. Had we introduced some asynchrony there, Maybe we could have decoupled the front-end thread pool from the interior thread pool that was actually issuing the database queries. Um, that's the type of technique you do to uh, make sure you can remain available even in the face of partial failures. Uh, 
Okay, we're gonna leave the database behind now and just talk about other issues with integration points. One thing that I see a lot is that we test for and we design for failures that are uh, defined within the specifications of the protocols we're using. So, you know, when we're dealing with TCP, connection refused is a perfectly legitimate kind of response to a TCP connection request. Um, accepting the connection into a listen queue, but then never completing it and leaving it in a half open state, that's not really an acceptable part of the protocol, but it does happen. When we're talking HTTP, getting back a response code 500, perfectly reasonable. We know how to deal with that. If you think you're talking HTTP and instead the server answers with SMTP, you're going to have a much bigger issue, right? You're not actually talking the protocol you thought you were talking, so none of your parsing will work. I love doing things like um, testing services by sending an infinite stream of open element tags when they think they're talking XML. Uh, blows out nearly every XML parser on Earth. They just can't, they can't handle it, uh, and they eventually consume all memory and throw you know, out-of-memory errors or just abort a process. These out-of-spec failures are the kinds of things I call wicked errors. They do happen in production. They will never happen in QA unless you force them to. And sometimes uh, even trying to force them in QA seems a little bit insane. You know, I'm designing an integration point that's supposed to talk JSON over HTTPS. Why would I send back streaming binary MP3 files? Well, just to see if the server can handle it. Because somewhere, some, someday in production, someone's going to send you an unending stream of binary data. Maybe they do it accidentally. Maybe they're doing it deliberately to try and kill your system. Another issue with integration points is that debugging the problems with them often requires peeling back one or more layers of abstraction. So think about the database problem that I was talking about. In order to observe that, we had to get all the way down to doing packet traces on the wire to see a high number of TCP retransmits. Well, in the application code, we were dealing with a java.sql.sql connection object. That object is an abstraction over some bytes in memory. Right? The object tells us how to interpret the bytes in memory. One of the sections of bytes is supposed to be a pointer to a socket. We go and look at the socket. It's basically another chunk of memory. One of the items is a, a file handle, which is an index into a table in the kernel. That table just has a bunch of numbers that say, you know, this destination address, port, and sequence number represents a connection. So we're drilling through many layers of abstraction to finally get to what's happening at a level where we can diagnose it. The bigger your system is, the faster these problems will propagate. So we tend to think that scaling something up buys us more time or gives us more ability to survive. But in fact, it usually just means that there's more traffic and you amplify these errors even faster. There are some patterns that we can use to, to help us with these integration points. I'm going to talk about uh, a few of these a little later on. Uh, and uh, test harnesses are not something I'm going to be talking about today, but it's a way that you can uh, test for these conditions before you reach production, basically doing evil things to your own system before someone else does. Once you have a failure uh, in one node, you're actually more likely to get failures in other nodes. So it's tempting to look at a horizontally scaled uh, farm of of servers or machines or containers or whatever, and statistically treat them as uh, identical independent devices. They are not. They're highly correlated. Uh, one way that they're correlated is through your software. So the software you put on these devices is always a common mode among them. Uh, in this case, suppose we have something that goes down uh, due to a load-related condition. Maybe it's a memory leak. Uh, maybe it's a race condition where the more load you've got, the more likely you are to observe the race condition. But in whatever case, uh, we have one of the nodes, S4 here, uh, going down because of load. Well, the load then gets redistributed on the other nodes. Not only are they equally, well, if they were uncorrelated, we would expect them to be equally likely to fail as the original one. But in fact, we're distributing more load on them so their failure, given the failure of the original one, is more likely. 
Um, you can watch these sort of uh, popping like a row of flash bulbs on a camera, and you'll see each one failing faster than the one before. This is something that's really common uh, when you do have memory leaks, because things tend to get restarted all around the same time when you deploy a release. And so they're all leaking memory at roughly the same rate, just one of them tips over first. And then the traffic on the others causes them to go faster and faster. So if you've got a large array of servers, it is not like the lighted sign in front of a casino where one light bulb out is no big deal and you wait until 10% of them are down to go fix it. When one goes down, you need to find out why and fix it as quickly as possible. This often happens with resource leaks and connection pools. Uh, and separating your capacity into different bulkheads is, is one of the ways that you uh, defeat this. Once you have a chain reaction in one layer, you need to be concerned about what happens with other layers that call into that one. So this is something that I think of as the microservice system failure mode, uh, because we often have this uh, deep stack of tiers of services calling other services that call other services. When one of those goes down, your system can either amplify the failure and allow the, the damage to jump the gap, uh, or it can dampen the failure. Sadly, most of the ways that we write calls between systems are synchronous request response calls with no timeout, and that amplifies the failure. So we really need to keep a mentality of uh, containing damage and preventing it from jumping the gaps. Uh, one of the places you see this a lot is around things like uh, connection pools or thread pools for making out calls. Uh, once those get exhausted, uh, you'll start consuming the threads in your layer, uh, and then you stop responding to your caller. Timeouts and circuit breakers are effective against this. The next anti-pattern I want to uh, share with you is something that um, my friend Paul Lord described as uh, good marketing can kill your system at any time. Uh, in fact, the better your marketing is, the more likely you are to suffer from this. Um, this is an attack of self-denial because you're doing it to yourself. Very common pattern. Uh, retailers have, have uh, uh, demonstrated this for us many times. Uh, I remember when the Xbox 360 was brand new, Amazon sent out a, a, a poll to all the Amazon Prime customers asking, which of these three things would you most like a discount on during Thanksgiving? Would you like a discount on an Xbox 360? Would you like an Xbox on a garden stool that you can put your gardening implements in? Uh, or would you like a discount on a bicycle? Well, of course, the voting was like 98% for the Xbox. And so they offered a steep discount on the Xbox 360 on a particular day, at a particular time, with the time zone specified. So they made sure everyone was going to show up at exactly the same minute of the same day. And Amazon took themselves down for 20 minutes. And when you think about the kind of capacity they have, you know that you're vulnerable to this. There are things you can do to, uh, to defend against this. Make sure marketing offers don't send out deep links. Uh, I had one uh, client where the marketer was just browsing on his own desktop, picked out a, a link that included a specific machine that they were bound to. It uh, bypassed the CDN because inside the company walls, they didn't want to go all the way out through the CDN and incur those costs. Um, and it had a session ID in it. That was the link that got put into the email that got distributed to everyone. There are things you can do to make serving the traffic lighter. Uh, static landing pages are a great approach. You can even put a static landing page out at your CDN and um, uh, only allow the second click to reach your actual servers. And there are things like throttling and uh, uh, lightweight pages that you can do. The catch is this only works if you know that the traffic is coming. And in many companies, marketing has gotten uh, the, the no from IT so often that they don't even talk anymore. So one thing you can do is try and reestablish lines of communication by talking to your marketing department and saying, hey, can I see the marketing calendar? First of all, it'll be fun to watch them faint because someone from IT is actually interested in marketing. 
uh, when they get back off the floor, they'll be happy to share the marketing calendar because these things don't happen instantaneously. They're planned well in advance. Uh, and if you don't support your marketers, they will work around you and they'll go through third-party services and do things that might jeopardize your systems even worse than the original offer that they were contemplating. So moving on, uh, another big issue is scaling effects. So we tend to build things that are like one-to-one-to-one. -to -one -to -one. You know, I've got my service, and I've got a thing I'm calling, and I've got a database, and they're all sized about the same. There's one instance of everything running on my box. And then you get to production, and you're like, well, my service has five instances, and it's being called by something with 4,000 instances. That ratio is a little bit different. The traffic patterns are a little bit different, and it can cause a big issue for your service. Um, for example, one of the communication patterns that never belongs in production is point-to-point uh, -point messaging. So this was a particular uh, platform where they had a, a caching layer as part of their uh, database abstraction tool. And if you wrote through to the database, your node would communicate to all the other nodes to knock that item out of cache. Well, when you're in dev, it's just a local call. It didn't even go out through a network. In QA, it was sort of unnoticeable because there was one local call and one TCP connection. In production, uh, it's kind of going up as an n squared function, right? So in production, we had about 100 nodes. Each one would open up 99 connections, send one packet to each, and then close 99 connections. Almost all of our network bandwidth was just these cache and validation notices. Why was it point to point? No reason at all. That should have been broadcast. So watch out for this uh, type of communication pattern. Another place where we see scaling effects really kicking in is with uh, shared resources. So uh, anything like a cluster manager, a lock manager, uh, network components like firewalls, API gateways, um, uh, ESB appliances, these kinds of things, they're all a place where you have a, a fan in from some horizontally scaled thing to some vertically scaled thing. You can always win at horizontally scaling over the amount of vertical scaling you can do. Now, this is not the type of thing that you can test out of existence very easily because we don't build QA environments up to the same size as we do production. It's not economically viable. So this is a place where you have to apply some engineering. You know, desk check the ratios among the things that you're uh, dealing with, all the different layers of your system. Watch out for the things that are invisible in your typical diagram. So normally when you draw an application uh, architecture diagram, you don't depict uh, network components. They're part of the substrate. But the network components are a funnel uh, that traffic goes through. Even after you've done that desk checking, you may run into this kind of a problem where um, you have different sizes at different layers of your system, and you have that deliberately. Because most of the time, most of the traffic from something like your online store doesn't go through to order management. And so it's kind of OK that the online store has six times as many threads available to make calls as the middle tier has to respond to them. But if traffic patterns change, you're not really stable. You're only sort of stable by convention and under normal patterns. So at this particular uh, retailer, there was a big offer during Thanksgiving weekend uh, offering uh, free home delivery and installation of big screen TVs. Uh, just in time for the peak of football season. And that caused a big change in people's traffic patterns. Suddenly, a lot more people were looking up delivery dates and availability for uh, home installation. And so a much larger fraction of those online store threads were making calls to order management, and it was making more calls to scheduling than normal. Well, that caused everything to, to pile up. So the scheduling system stopped responding. The uh, order management system got slow, couldn't actually process any orders because all of its threads were busy trying to look up delivery dates. Um, and uh, we had to sit there on the online store turning on and off features all weekend long to try and you know, eke out a little more revenue and then turn it off when things were getting wobbly. Uh, 
So it is a type of scaling effect. It's very common in a large enterprise um, because you, you tend to build each of these things in isolation in different groups. We can do some desk checking on this and see if it's a potential problem. When it is a potential problem, your best bet is to stress both sides of the interface. So unhook the front end caller and put in a load generator that calls the back end with much more load than it's intended to take and see what happens. Does it simply crumble? Or does it give fast errors? Does it get slow? Um, maybe it's good and it sheds load and tells the front end, I can't do this right now, ask again later. Do the same thing with the front end and see what happens when the calls it's making get slow or stop responding. Your front end should be safe against that kind of thing, but you need to test for it and observe what really happens. Now, I'm emphasizing slow responses because this is another anti-pattern. I would much rather have a fast no or a connection refused than someone say, yeah, I can try to get that done and then drag it out and drag it out and drag it out. Um, oh, I'm supposed to be talking about systems, not coworkers. Uh, with systems, I'd rather have a fast failure or a fast no than a slow response or a slow failure. So you look at something like a TCP connection refused, and that's like a one microsecond operation. You look at something like uh, allowing a connection into a listen queue and then just not getting around to it until it times out, and that's like a one second to one minute operation. So let's not tie up the resources on the front end, because the longer the responses are in a service provider, the larger the caller needs to scale to handle the same amount of traffic. So it's actually like a gain knob on our scaling of the calling side. And very often, a uh, slow response ends in a failure or a timeout, and the work was wasted anyway. This can creep in in a lot of places. Excess load is the most obvious one and, and the most common one. Um, but we can also find things like the network being too busy. So I've been in companies when they were uh, dealing with a worm rampaging around their network, and suddenly, you know, their network's at like 80% saturation all the time, and uh, backend calls get really slow. Components like firewalls can get overloaded. Uh, you know, the first time I had a, a network admin tell me that the firewall's CPU was at 100%, it was a revelation. I'm like, oh yeah, they have CPUs. They can be overloaded too. Some protocols you really need to beware. Uh, NFS has retries built in, DNS has retries built in. In fact, some older versions of NFS had retries built in in the kernel that were uninterruptible. Um, your own remote protocols may be an issue as well if you do things like an N plus one query pattern. You, you ask for the extent of all the results and then you ask for each result one at a time. Slow responses are one of the ways that damage jumps the gap and causes those cascading failures. They do provoke people into pounding reload uh, at the end user level, and they provoke calling systems into retrying their calls. So we want to watch out for that. The final anti-pattern I want to talk about is uh, unbounded result sets. So when you make a query, uh, you don't often get to specify how many results do I want. Uh, if you're going through something like an ORM, it's definitely not the default behavior. And if you're going through an ORM and actually traversing a relationship from a parent record to a child record type, um, it's very difficult to say, no, I, I really only want the first million of those things. Don't send me all 12 million. Um, SQL queries, you can add limits to the clauses. Um, uh, but you, know, you, you have to think about it. And the syntax is a little bit different for each uh, flavor of SQL. I often see this with uh, service architectures. So you'll, again, have this n plus 1 pattern where you ask for the extent, and then you ask for each item. So you want to make sure that you test with real data volumes and real um, uh, relationships and real distributions. So you know, if you are building a social network, make sure you're testing with a, a power law for the number of connections that each person has, not a Gaussian. All right? because you'll find those, those black hole people who have 50,000 connections instead of the median of one connection. OK, so that was kind of the bad news section. I want to uh, talk about the good news. Um, you know, One of the patterns that you can use is timeouts. 
So a lot of the anti-patterns I described are just failures to apply timeouts and, and the willingness to block infinitely. Uh, things like connection pools almost always have one version of checkout that uh, blocks forever and one version that has a timeout. I wish people would just get rid of the version that blocks forever and only supply the version that takes a timeout. When you apply timeouts, you have to decide what you're going to do if the timeout occurs. So do I retry the work? Do I queue it up to call it later? Uh, how am I going to handle that? Do I just report error to the user? Um, another area that I, I'm really leery about is binary client jars or client uh, DLLs, that sort of thing. Um, because they're written by programmers just like us. They don't have enough time. They don't get to do enough testing. Uh, maybe they don't know about these kinds of problems. The main difference is you can't see it. And so when there is something uh, problematic inside that code, it's much harder to get to. So timeouts are pretty useful uh, against a lot of those anti-patterns. Circuit breakers are kind of the, the pattern that's gotten the most popular and, and caught the most uh, buzz, I guess. The idea is uh, we shouldn't be doing retry loops like this where you, you attempt an operation, it fails, and you basically immediately attempt it again. Um, it takes, what, one nanosecond to get from the bottom of that while loop back up to the top. What kind of problem disappears after one nanosecond? What makes this more likely to succeed on the third attempt or the fifth attempt instead of the first? And if the third attempt is more likely, shouldn't I set my retries to something like 1,000? Well, I don't want to... I don't want to do the retries at all. Uh, the problems are very likely to still be present one nanosecond later. The only kind of problem that disappears that fast is something like a dropped packet, um, which your lower level protocol takes care of anyway. Retries make users wait. They tie up calling resources on the system. Um, they very often end in failure anyway, so you're just delaying the response and provoking a slow response. So the idea with a circuit breaker is we wrap it around any kind of a dangerous call. Um, and you've already heard me talk about what dangerous calls mean. We count failures uh, in making that call. And when there are too many failures, we, we basically cut off the interface and say, um, we're going to return an immediate error or an immediate fallback rather than making the, the call all the way through. After some period of time has elapsed, and, and usually this is a human scale period of time, I'm willing to try again to make the call. If the call works, then great. I'm back to normal operation, and I can reintegrate the feature into full operation. Um, if it doesn't work, then something's still wrong, and I go back to the state where I don't keep trying. One of the nice things about using the circuit breaker is it doesn't require every thread and every request to discover anew that the thing it's trying to talk to is broken. You know, if you got a timeout one millisecond ago, why would you issue another call when you think you're going to get another timeout? Um, there are loads of open source libraries that implement circuit breakers. I definitely recommend picking up one of those rather than doing your own work, because you are sharing information across threads. That's tricky business. Um, I do not recommend sharing circuit breaker state across all of your uh, calling services. Uh, and that's basically just a trade-off between saying, yes, more of my nodes have to independently discover the failure versus uh, the risk of new failure modes from sharing the state across the servers. You definitely uh, need to talk about what to do when the circuit breaker is, is popped. Um, what's your fallback strategy? Can you use cache data? Do you need to queue the work for a later retry? Is there a secondary service you can try? Uh, these are all legitimate approaches. It's both a technical and a business process discussion to have. Exposing the state of circuit breakers across your system makes a great way to look at um, sort of overall health. If I have 20 nodes and they're all showing red on the same circuit breaker, then I'm pretty sure the problem is with the provider. If I have 20 nodes and two of them are showing red, then it's likely that the problem is on the calling side, or there's an intermittent problem in the network in between them. So next pattern I like to apply is uh, something I call bulkheads. 
and the metaphor here is from ships. Uh, never mind the Titanic, they were just implemented wrong there, it, the design was fine, it was a bad implementation. Um, the idea is that we compartmentalize the system so that some parts of the system can go down and other parts survive. When we create multiple thread pools inside a, an application, we're creating uh, two compartments or multiple compartments with bulkheads between them. Uh, process binding to CPUs, again, uh, compartments with bulkheads. One approach that I particularly like, uh, especially in the sort of SaaS arena, is different server pools for different priority clients. So if you're on a freemium model, you know, you should definitely think about uh, allocating some pools to your premium clients and having all your free clients kind of mingle, toge <clears throat> mingle together in steerage class. Bulkheads really help with this kind of common mode uh, dependency. Foo and bar here uh, can each damage the other uh, in a denial of service by over-consuming BAS. If you can separate them into different uh, pools with um, uh, dedicated clients, then neither one can harm the other. Now, one thing about uh, doing the bulkheads is that you really need to pick a useful uh, level of granularity to apply this at. Uh, it's, it's not helpful to do it at every level. So you don't need to do thread pools and process binding and server binding and containers and so on. Okay, I am going to jump ahead just a little bit. Um, uh, the next really important pattern is fail fast. It's often uh, possible to find out whether an operation is going to succeed before you get all the way into it. So there are things like um, acquiring critical resources and checking parameters and checking on your internal state. These are all ways of detecting whether you're going to be able to complete a request uh, before you've spent a lot of time doing it. It's useful to do this sort of thing uh, so that you uh, dampen failures. So if you can apply fail fast and do it by looking at the state of your circuit breakers, then you can say, uh, you know, damage to this other part of the system would normally put stress on the entire enterprise, but I'm actually gonna act like a shock absorber and not transmit that damage upward. Uh, checking resources and integration points via circuit breakers is one of the great ways to do it. Uh, validating input is another great way to do it. We can often apply more validation than you would think. Uh, it sometimes looks a little bit like breaking encapsulation, but I could also make a case that it's, it's, uh, it can be done by providing a richer API on your domain objects. The final stability pattern I want to talk about is uh, using decoupling middleware. Uh, and basically, this is all about going async. If we look at this spectrum of coupling that uh, I think David Gelertner originated, there are a lot of positions along this spectrum that we can explore. Uh, when we're doing in-process method calls, we don't worry too much about differential availability. If the library is there, the caller is there, um, because you're running in the same process. We keep reinventing remote procedure calls under different names. About once a decade, we, we get a new acronym for remote procedure calls. But there's a lot of value to be had in moving further to the right on this spectrum. Uh, when we do uh, messaging, for example, we have the ability for the provider to be offline while the caller is still functioning, or vice versa. We have the ability to absorb a, a spike in load and spread it out over time because we've got messages in a queue that we can digest at the throughput of the back end. And so those unbalanced capacities and scaling effects are much easier to deal with. Now, unfortunately, changing middleware often requires a rewrite. It's not a simple kind of drop-in thing. Switching from you know, REST, HTTP, JSON calls to uh, Avro messages on a Kafka bus, yeah, that's a, that's a big change. Um, and sometimes those decisions are made at a level where we don't really get to counterman them. But I'll say, the more of these uh, different architectural styles you can uh, have in your toolbox, uh, and the later you can make the decisions, the better the chances you're going to have of creating a system with a lot of stability. So we have to accept 
that problems are going to occur. Faults are going to be initiated. Uh, we're going to have bugs. We're going to have latent issues. The big issue, or the big question is, do we amplify those throughout our enterprise, or do we find ways to dampen or nullify them? And I view this a lot as uh, acting like cracks in metal. So when metal is fatigued, a crack gets started someplace, and then uh, maybe the structure of the metal is such that the crack gets stopped at a crystalline boundary, and nothing bad happens. If that doesn't occur, the crack accelerates at supersonic speed through the metal, and you have a catastrophic failure of the metal, something like a plain fuselage ripping open. We don't want our plain fuselages ripping open. We want something more like this, where we've got crack stoppers. We've got ways of dampening the failure and preventing it from uh, propagating and accelerating. The system is still damaged. We can't prevent that completely. I hope I've convinced you of that uh, with the, uh, the 5 a.m. problem with the database. But at least we can preserve some features for some users. And we can prevent those uh, uh, catastrophic failures. And with that, uh, I thank you for your attention. And I believe we have time for some questions. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> Very interesting. Um, we do actually have a question here I'll bring up first, and then we have time for some more, possibly. What are your thoughts on tools such as Chaos Monkey? I'm a big fan of Chaos Monkey and the whole Simeon army. Uh, I want to see him go on a world tour. Uh, I think those, those tools are fantastic for exactly the, the reason that I said uh, it's hard to test these problems out in QA. You kind of need real production environments, real scale, uh, real topologies. Um, uh, and I, I love the idea of forcing yourself to be anti-fragile by creating problems when there aren't enough. Uh, I liken it to uh, uh, the, the theory that autoimmune disorders are on the rise because our immune systems aren't challenged enough. And so, you know, the, the immunologists are recommending that we go out and eat dirt to get more challenges to our immune system. The chaos monkey is kind of like eating dirt. Okay. Uh, we actually did have another question. <laughs> we have another question here. How can monitoring, monitoring system design help or hurt cascading failures? Uh, that's a fantastic question. Um, unfortunately, there is, a, there is a big issue with a lot of monitoring systems in that they only report when things happen. They don't report when things don't happen. And so this is one of those places where the absence of a signal is the information you want. So uh, I would look for monitoring systems that know how to collect heartbeats. And as soon as you stop seeing heartbeats, that's a big issue. OK. Uh, do we have any? Uh, we have time for possibly one other question if somebody didn't put one in and would like to bring one up. Anybody else? Oh, back here. OK. So we'll, we'll do one more. Here you go. Let's get the mic so that we want to make sure that everybody hears it. Uh, when's the second edition coming out? No comment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a quick answer. Uh, anybody else want to throw one in before we break for lunch, or everybody's ready for lunch? Okay, let's I'm thank Michael once again. Let's do. <laughs>